and welcome to week five of an introduction to paleontology with the Safe Cultural Heritage Group. I'm Jenna, your mentor, as always, and um, yeah, today we'll, it's all about mammalian evolution, which is really exciting. week we will be learning about what mammals are, mammalian evolution pre-Mesozoic, mammalian evolution during the Mesozoic and, mam uh, and mammals uh, after the end Cretaceous mass extinction. What is a mammal? Mammals are a group of vertebrate animals, which means that they have a backbone, um, constituting of the class mammalia. Mammalia is a class which is um, because it's a group of animals with shared characteristics and ancestors. So there are four subgroups, three of which are extant, which means living today, and one of them is extinct. So the three extant are the um, placental mammals, which belong to the group uh, Eutheria, as well as metatheriums, which include marsupials and monotremes. The one extinct, um, the one extinct um, mammal um, family are the multituberculates. And um, mammals started to... Um, evolve really from the late Carboniferous where we see the mammalian line divert from the reptilian and in the late Triassic true mammals evolved. The key characteristics of mammals include mammary glands, fur or being quite hairy unless this has been secondarily lost such as what we are now, um, bellow lungs which is the type of lungs that we humans have and this is where the rib in the diaphragm expand and contract with each um, breath. There is, um, we also have a neocortex which is part of the um, brain's cerebral cortex which is where higher cognitive functioning is thought to have originated from and this is present in all mammals. However, um, we also have the corpus callosum which is a large bundle of more than 200 million nerve fibres that connect to the two, uh, that connect the two brain hemispheres and this is only in placentals which include us and the marsupials um, however monotremes such as platypuses and echidna, uh, echidnas do not have a corpus callosum. Um, we have one jawbone which is known as the dentary so this here uh, in humans we call it the mandible um, and this dentary formed from um, no, sorry. Uh, the three, and we also have three ear bones known as the malle malleus, which is the hammer, the incus, which is the anvil, and the stapes, which is the stirrups. And these ear bones actually originated from the bones that um, our ancestors had in the lower jaw. Um, so we had loads of little bones that made up the um, the dentary area and during the mammalian evolution these three bones the ear bones moved up leaving one big bone here and we usually have seven um seven cervical vertebrae so um for example humans we have seven down our neck giraffes also have seven however their um their bones are a lot elongated however there are seven there are some animals that do have um Different amounts of cervical vertebrae. For example, sloths have um, up between eight or ten cervical vertebrae, which is really bizarre. Kind of most common way of telling um, the three different types of mammals, extant mammals, apart are the reproductive reproductive organs. So there are three major body plans for this. So monotremes they um, lay eggs, and their mammary glands secrete milk through patches of skin instead of having teeth. Um, marsupials nurture, um, these are kind of best known for having the pouches, for example kangaroos, and they can nurture two different offspring at different developmental stages. Um, there are two types of um, milk that are being produced simultaneously with marsupials, which is high car um, carbohydrate and low fat for the neonate, whereas low carbohydrate and high fat for the infant. So they're the two developmental stages that go on inside marsupials. Um, and they also have restricted ecological niches. So that means that it's um, that way of 
um, reproducing is better for them. Placentals, which include us, we carry neonates to full term. Um, there's no need for prolonged care of the neonate, so in quite a few animals they can just give birth and go. Um, and also this um, way for us, for the placental mammals, means that mammals have been able to become fully marine. I have some examples of the three um, the three mammals that are still it's um, the three mammal groups that are still alive today. So we have the monotremes, which include the echidnas and the platypuses. We have the marsupials, which include kangaroos, wallabies, um, and opossums. And then we have placentals, which are basically every other mammal um, after these. So this could include bats, squirrels, sea lions, um, elephants. Zebras, us, whales, bears, dogs, cats, everything really. <laughs> so the way that we tell the difference between um, mammals and reptiles is um, usually quite often through the skull configuration. So mammals are the only living members of the synapsids and um, reptiles and birds are diapsids. And this is kind of based on the amount of temporal fenestrae that are present. And so temporal fenestrae are these holes that occur in the temporal bone, which is kind of roughly here-ish on a human. Um, so yeah, and the synapses diverge from the diapsids during the Carboniferous. So we see this split between the two um, clades really in the Carboniferous. So around 370 million years ago. And there are some differences. So for example, the diapsids have two and the synapsids only have one hole, well, temporal fenestrae. And there are other school configurations, for example, the anaspids, which don't have any holes in their, um, they don't have any temporal fenestrae. There are also some diapsids, for example, tortoises, which have lost both temporal fenestrae and can appear as anaspids. Um, however, they are diapsids because they are reptilian, um, but they don't have these temporal fenestrae. Here we have this really lovely um, cladogram of all the different mammals that are extinct, uh, extant today. And if you can see quite closely, there are there is this really pale grey kind of rectangular rectangular box, and that is shown showing the um, boundary between the um, Mesozoic, which is in the grey, and the Cenozoic, which is the white. So, and what these are, um, the colour-coded branches are the plus, um, in the placental mammals correspond to the different, um, the different groups. So, for example, we have the Laurasiotheria, which is in green, which include hedgehogs, bats and pangolins. We have the um, Euacre Tontoglis, <laughs> which include rodents, rabbits and hares, lemurs and primates. We have the Xenarthra, which are in orange, and that includes um, anteaters, sloths and armadillos. And then we have the Afrotheria, which is in pink, which include golden moles, elephant trues, aardvarks, hyraxes, elephants and sea cows. So it's just a really, really useful diagram. Now we will move on to the early synapsids. And, um, Primitive synapsids are usually known as pelicosaurs, or they're known as pelicosaur-grade synapsids. You might hear the term mammal-like reptiles thrown around, but this is no longer used. Um, so, um, primitive synapsids are referred to as stem mammals, or also known as proto-mammals. They were the largest terrestrial vertebrates during the Permian, and their numbers and diversity were reduced were reduced by the permian triassic extinction and by the end of the permian all of the older forms of synapsids which are also known as the pelicosaurs were gone and replaced by the more advanced therapsids which include the lineage that we come from we'll start with the caseosauria and these are um known from the late carboniferous and the permian and there are two families. There is the small insectivorous or carnivorous Eotheridae, as well as the large herbivorous Caesidae. And um, the Eothrysis, which is shown here on the left, this is known from North America, um, from the early Permian of Texas. And it has, um, yeah, and then we've got the Caesidae, which are known from North America, Russia, Italy, and France. An example would be the um, 
Cotylorhynchus on the bottom right, and this is known from the early and middle Permian of Texas and Oklahoma. It's considered one of the early, uh, largest terrestrial vertebrates during the early Permian, which was th and it was three meters in length, but it did have a really disproportionately sh small sh um, skull, and it was most likely to be a herbivore. And these are kind of the basal of the synapsids. We'll now move on to the Varanop uh, Varanopids. There are 11 genera of the Varanopids, and they stem from the late, late Carboniferous to the early Permian. And they're found in the USA, and then um, they are also found in Russia and South Africa in Middle Permian age deposit rocks. And we think that they're more likely to be carnivores, and they were kind of similar in, to monitor lizards in both size and kind of how they ate. Um, recent studies have found that there's um, quite good support for ver the varanopids to be reptiles instead of synapsids, but this is kind of contradicted by the morphological evidence because it does show features of true pelicosaurs. Um, for example, deep, narrow, elongated skulls, um, long jaws and sharp teeth, but they also um, show lizard-like features such as long tails, lizard-like bodies and thin legs. So it's kind of unsure where they sit on the um, family tree really. We'll move on to the um, Ophiocodontids. These were previously kind of at the basal end of the um, synapsid tree, uh, it's been reshuffled around. There are six to seven genera and they range from the late Carboniferous to the early Permian. Um, they are early eupelicosaurs, which um, is the clade that encompasses all mammals and their um, closest extinct relatives. Um, it's debatable as to what lifestyle these animals had, um, as many were thought to be aquatic or semi-aquatic, however, more recent studies suggest terrestrial. Um, the earliest Ophiocodont was Archaeotheris, um, which we'll go into a bit more detail in the next slide. And the most famous is um, a Pheocodon, <laughs> I don't know why I'm butchering these words, um, and this is found in Permian age drops in New Mexico, and they were roughly 1.6 to 3 metres in length, and the snout region of the skull takes up three-fifths of the total skull length, and it's thought to be a carnivore. Archaeotheris is the earliest known synapsid, and it's dated to 306 million years ago, which is the late Carboniferous period. And we can see in its skulls that it shows the synapsid temporal fenestra, so the only one of them. It's already fully developed in this organism. It had strong jaws that could open extremely wide, as well as a pair of elon um, enlarged canines. So, these teeth here. And it belonged to the family um, Ophiocontidae, and it was found in Nova Scotia during the Carboniferous, which is in Canada. And in, during the Carboniferous, it was a, Nova Scotia was a swamp, and it was similar to the Everglades in like features in America, which so it would be quite swamp-like. Um, now move on to the Edaphosaurids, and these range temporally between the late Carboniferous and the early Permian, much like most of these um, organisms, and they've been found in both North America and Europe. These are quite well known because they have elongated neural spines, so um, on the spinal cord they had um, big bits of spine sticking out really. Um, of the cervical and dorsal vertebrae, and this was possibly covered in skin. I mean, uh, it would be lovely to have a um, time travel machine and actually see whether they were. Um, these sails, which is what we call them, evolved convergently with the sphenocodontids, um, which we'll go into a bit more detail about in the next slide. And um, so to evolve convergently means to evolve the same thing separately. So for example, bird wings and bat wings and pterosaur wings, they would all be evidence of convergent evolution. Um, so it's thought that some edaphosaurids were herbivores and this is shown by the structure of the skull and teeth. Um, for example, the upper and lower jaws had tooth plates, which meant that they could grind up vegetation like that. And it's thought to have possibly been one of the first herbivorous amniotes. Um, we think that the sail might have functioned as a temperature control device, sexual display, physical protection against predators, um, predators, 
or interspecies communication. So the functions may have been different in different species or it could have served several functions at once. And this is the same for the sphenocodontids. Sphenocodontids were medium to large sized carnivores during the early Permian and they are the most um, they are the dominant carnivores of the early Permian. So the overall family um, range from the late Carboniferous to the early Permian and their fossils have been found in both North America and Europe. They are the sister group to the Edaphosaurids, which is what we've just seen. And the clade Sphenocodontia is used to designate the group that includes uh, Sphenocodontids as well as their descendants, which include the um, Theraspids and now extinct, uh, extant mammals. And the most ex famous example of a Sphenocodontid was Dimetrodon, uh, which is found in early Permian rocks in Texas. Metrodon or Demetrodon um, is probably one of the most famous organisms that isn't a dinosaur. Um, and Dimetrodon means two measures tooth. And it refers to the differences in the tooth morphology that um, these organisms have, as well as the teeth that we do, um, that we have today. And they are found in the early Permian of Texas, as well as neighbouring states. However, some have also been found in Germany. They had a, a large sail on their back, which is their, um, because of their neural spines, which we can see on that picture to the left. Um, these could grow up to one metre in length. Um, the neural spines have grooves at the base, so picture this as your um, vertebrae, this would be your neural, um, neural spine. And at the base of these here, um, this is possibly where blood vessels were. And when the skeletons were found, the spines were usually articulated, which means that they were held together. Um, and we paleontologists have proposed that this is because uh, this is with a tough covering of skin during life. It hasn't fossilized, and it's thought that the sail would have acted as um, like a thermoregulatory system. So, um, like modern lizards and snakes, they it's theorized that they basked in the sun. Um, and yeah, so they reached up to a length of three metres as well. Um, it hasn't fossilised. And it's thought that the sail would have acted as um, like a thermoregulatory system. So um, like modern lizards and snakes, they it's theorised that they basked in the sun. Um, and yeah, so they reached up to a length of three metres as well. We'll now move on to the therapsids and these are a group of eupelicosaurian synapsids which include modern mammals and our ancestors and this is distinguished by numerous features that have not been seen in other um, synapsids such as an enlarged temporal fenestre, um, the anterior position of the jaw joint, these ones here, as well as modifications to the shoulder and pelvic joints to allow for the limbs um, to be orientated underneath the body instead of the sprawling gait. And these became the dominant land animals during the Middle Permian. There are four clades that we, um, that we recognise as a therapsid. The dinocephalians, um, the anomodonts, the biomasuchians and the theriodonts. We have a few examples of these therapsids. We've got the, um, a dinocephalian, a biomasuchian, an um, an omodont and a theriodont. Dicynodonts were herbivorous animals with a pair of tusks and a horny toothless beak. Um, and they first appeared in the mid Permian and they became dominant in the late Permian. They were kind of decimated by the end Permian extinction and then rebounded during the Triassic, dying out towards the end of the period. And they've been found in Russia, South Africa, Brazil, and China. Um, there are over 60 genera with, um, and they were just extremely diverse, varying from rat to hippo sized. And there's also, um, they became um, in the Triassic so much larger, for example, the hippo sized, fulfilling niches which are similar to modern day browsers such as rhinos and elephants. And there are examples of numerous different lifestyle styles in the Dicynodonts, um, include burrowers and because we know this because we found evidence of fossilized burrows with the dicynodonts in climbers diggers and browsers are another um well-known permian 
organism and they were the dominant carv carnivores during the late Permian and their temporal range is just simply the middle to late Permian. There's, over, there's only 35 genera and they've been found in rocks in South Africa, Russia and China. And we, what I like about Gorgonopsids is they remind me of saber-toothed cats and this is due to their elongated canines, um, as you can see on the pictures below. And past the canines, the, the teeth were either absent or really, really reduced. Um, they also, um, an example of one, Arctognathus, could have opened its jaw to an angle of 90 degrees. So we're talking like, like that for a jaw opening, which is crazy. <laughs> and um, they increased in size during the Permian. Um, and we know this because they grew from um, there's fossils of them having really small skulls um, from around 10 to 15 centimetres in the middle Permian, um, going up to about bear-like proportions with a skull of 60 centimetres plus in the upper Permian. And Gorgonopsids became extinct during um, one of the phases of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. So cynodonts are um, outside of... Um, no, sorry. Uh, cynodonts have a temporal range of the late Permian to recent um, because these are the organisms in which all mammals of like current mammals have evolved from and they diversified greatly after the Permian Triassic extinction event. There are only six or seven different species during the Permian and um, this the these organisms cynodonts we can tell are kind of more like modern mammals because they only have one dentary with the rest of the ear bo uh, rest of the bones moving to the inner ear. Um, their teeth were fully di uh, differentiated giving it a um, heterodont dentition so kind of like ours we've got our molars, premolars, incisors, canines etc and um, the brain case bulged at the back of the head. So um, it's believed that cynodonts probably laid eggs and um, they also had um, a wide zygomatic arch. So if you look at a cynodont skull, just kind of where our cheekbones would be, they would have a zygomatic arch. And this widened, allowing for a more robust jaw musculature, meaning they could eat more different things. Now move on to Mesozoic mammals. So the first recognisable mammals appear during the late Triassic. Um, the oldest known definite mammal um, was found in late Triassic rock, rocks, ugh, rocks in Texas in the USA. And this is known from the brain case material of um, Adela Bacillus. Um, the most famous Mesozoic mammal though um, is Morganucodon which is from the late Triassic to the middle Triassic rock. And Morganucodon was first found in Glamorgan, Wales, so here in the UK. And then it was also found in Yunnan in China, as well as in some European and North American deposits. And Mesozoic mammals were generally shrew-like in appearance and size, um, with really small skulls ranging from around 20 to 30 millimetres, with total body lengths of um, 15 centimetres and there were roughly 34 mammalian families recorded in the Jurassic and Cretaceous so um, mammals did get quite big during the Mesozoic so we're thinking kind of mid dog size is the largest they would have been. Don'ts are um, small, four, um, four feet on the floor Plantigradus, that's what it's known as, insectivorous animals, um, with roughly 15 species found within the Mesozoic. Um, the tail was moderately long and the skull was roughly two to three centimetres in length and the rest of the body length was about 10 centimetres. So the skeleton, bar the skull, is poorly known. So we kind of only know more gnucodonts from the skull material. Um, we also know that they had a sprawling gait in the front limbs but a mammalian gait in the hind limbs, which is quite weird. Um, they're mainly found in the early Jurassic Europe, North America, China and South Africa.
And as I said before, they were first found in Wales and then again in China. We talked about last week with the um, dinosaurs, the J-hole biota is really good at preserving um, fossil mammals. So in the J-hole, um, in the J-hole um, biota, we found 11 species belonging to five major groups of mammals. So these include the multi-tuberculates, the um, eutrichodontans, sorry, the symmetridodontans, the metatherians and the eutherians. And they've all been found in the um, J-Hall biota in Liaoning, China. Many of these species are kind of just found as skulls as well as articulated skeletons. And what's great about the J-Hall biota is that um, we often find fur found in the fossils, which are just incredible. And um, fossils from the J-Hole biota have provided evidence on the transitional mammalian middle ear. So from the bones in the jaw to the full E-formed ear. We'll now move on to um, more recent mammals. So um, this is the one extinct like family of mammals, which is known as the multi-tuberculates. And these were the largest group of Mesozoic mammals with 125 different species. And they are known for the multiple cusps on their teeth. So multi tubercles, which are the multi cusps. Um, they range from the middle Jurassic to the Eocene and there are no living descendants of the multi tuberculates. Um, so between the middle Jurassic and the Eocene, there was less than um, 200, no, more than 200 species. And they were distributed globally, um, and they were kind of like rodents. However, they were probably eventually outcompeted by the rodents. And we know that multi-tuberculates had large incisors and a diastema, which is the gap between teeth. Phylogenetically, multi-tuberculates are usually placed as a crown group mammal outside of the two main groups of living mammals. The, therial, the therians, which include placentals and marsupials, as well as the monotremes. And multi-tuberculates are more closely to theria, the therians, than to the monotremes. First, um, oh my god, no. So the first um, living group of mammals are the monotremes. There are only five extant species of monotremes. Um, there's a single species in the family um, Ornithorhynchidae, which are the platypus, and there are four different species of the echidnas, which are in the family Tachyglossidae, um, and these four species are divided into two genera. Um, there is one species of short-billed uh, beaked echidna, and three species of long-beaked echidnas. And monotremes lay eggs and they don't have any teats. So when feeding their young, milk is provided for um, them because they, um, by secreting the milk out of the pores on the belly. And um, monotremes lack the connective structure, the corpus callosum, of um, which placental mammals have. And this is the primary communication route between the left and the right brain hemispheres. The um, fossil record of monotremes, however, is really sparse, with the first Mesozoic monotreme being discovered um, dating from the Cretaceous. However, um, so that's the fossil record, but the genetic record suggests that monotremes have um, an origin back in the Triassic. And they are the oldest living taxon of, of the mammalian class, which I just think is really cool. Now we will discuss the difference between the placental mammals and the marsupials. This cladogram here is really useful at showing the sort of difference between the mars the difference in times really between marsupials and the placentals and all the different splits. Um, the darker grey at the bottom is the Cretaceous and then the rest of it's up until now. So the red box are the marsupials and the blue box are placentals. But we will be discussing therian mammals, which include both placental mammals and the marsupials. The earliest known therian mammal fossil is Jeremiah, which is from the late Jurassic, 
um, of China. However, molecular data suggests that therians may have originated even earlier from the early Jurassic. So this is another case of the fossil record differing from the genetic re um, record. Eels are, um, we all know them as kangaroos, wallabies, etc. There are 335 extant species across seven different orders um, between Australasia and the Americas. And we think that marsupials originated in the early Cretaceous of Asia and then spread globally. And we think that they split from placental mammals, also known as eutherians, during the mid-Jurassic. However, there's no fossil evidence from this time, but DNA and protein analysis um, suggests that the split between marsupials and placental mammals is roughly 100 to 120 million years ago. Um, the distinctive characteristic of marsupials is what we all know, they carry their young in a pouch. Um, they are mainly now known from um, Australia, so we, when we think of marsupials we do think of the Australian um, animals, um, but they're also found in South America and North America in the form of opossums. So there are four major clades, um, we've got the Dasyuromorpha, which have 70 species, which include marsupial mice, rats, well marsupial rats, um, Dasyurs, which are cat-like animals, uh, the Tasmanian devil and the thylacine, um, we have Paramelomorpha, which are 20 species, which include the bandicoots and the bilbies. Um, we have the Dipro Diprotodontia, which include 117 different species, split into possums um, and gliding phalanges. <laughs> the Macropodiforms, which include the wallabies and the kangaroos, and the Vombatiforms, which include koalas and wombats. And then the final clade is the um, notoriously Tomorpha, which include two extant species of marsupial moles. Here are some really lovely fossil examples of marsupials. We have um, Diprotodon, which is like a giant wombat. Phylocaleo, also known as the um, marsupial lion. Procoptodon, which is was a giant short-faced kangaroo, as well as the most recently extinct of the lineage thylacines. Um, and there's this really, really lovely fossil site in Australia um, known as the Narracoot Caves. And this is um, where it was a natural pitfall trap, which meant animals would probably fall into this ravine and died there. And the smell of the rotting flesh would have brought in my, um, like more predators and scavengers and then more animals would fall in and it was just a it's just really cool site I would definitely look it up. I'll move on to placental mammals and there are over 5,100 extant species and we we know that true placental mammals um, originated in the late Cretaceous roughly 90 million years ago however the most um, Earliest undisputed fossils are from the early Paleogene, roughly 66 million years ago, following the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, which um, again is an example of the molecular data not matching up with the morphological record. And the rapid appearance of placentals after the KPG mass extinction suggests that placentals had already originated and undergone diversification in the late Cretaceous. So modern members of placental orders originated in the Cenozoic roughly 66 to 23 million years ago. And it's thought that placental mammals diverged from eutherians, so um, marsupials, uh, roughly um, 80 to 99 million years ago, with modern orders, excluding the primates and xenarthrans, originating within 20 million years after the KPG just go through the different subdivisions and lineages of the placental mammals. So we've got um, the xenarthrins, which include armadillos, sloths and anteaters. We've got atherotheria, which as the name suggests means that they originated in Africa, which include aardvarks, elephant shrews, tenrex, hyraxes, elephants, manatees and the dugong. And then we've got the boreal eutheria, 
um, which include the um, you are could totally is oh, proper proper mangled that there which include the legomorpha which include rabbits hares and pikers the rodentias which are basically all rodents the chiroptera which are the bats the scandentia which are the tree shrews primates which include humans monkeys apes lemurs lorises etc and then you've also got laurasia theria which are um include hedgehogs shrews, moles, the artiodactyles, which include the even-toed ungulates, such as um, such as cows, gazelles, etc. And the perissodactyle, which are the odd-toed ungulates, which include the um, tapirs, horses, rhinos. Um, the artiodactyle, sorry, also include whales, um, which is really cool. You've got the pangolins and the carnivores, which include dogs, cats, bears, seals and mongooses. Mongoose? Mongooses. We just have this really lovely cladogram, um, which is kind of colour coordinated for all the different types of animals. And this is based on the genetic evidence rather than the morphological evidence, as we can tell that both of them don't really match up with each other. Here is the further reading. I would definitely recommend um, Beasts Before Us by en Elsa Pancaroli, as well as the um, loads of the other books. There's PBS Eon videos, which include the oddest couple in fossil record, which I'm going to include as a little post. Um, and then we've got other podcasts. Um, I'm going to include some more podcasts as well because um, I've just found new ones. Um, here are the references and then next week we will be looking at human evolution which is really exciting um so yeah thanks for watching um i can't believe next week is going to be the last week um you can find safe cultural heritage group at all these links and you can find me on all these links i hope you enjoy bye